what consciousness really holds to be the truth of the matter is only this intermediate state of imperfection, a state nevertheless which at least is supposed to be a progress towards perfection. But it cannot even be that, for to advance in morality would really be to move towards its disappearance. That is to say, the goal would be the nothingness or the abolition mentioned above of morality and consciousness itself. But to approach ever nearer to nothingness means to diminish. Besides, advancing as such, like diminishing, would assume quantitative differences in morality. But there can be no question of these in it. In morality, as in consciousness, for which the moral purpose is pure duty, there cannot be any thought at all of difference, least of all of the superficial one of quantity. There is only one virtue, only one pure duty, only one morality. Paragraph 623 picks up where the previous one left us. That is in this problematic dialectic of the development of morality. And, and what do we mean by development of morality? We're talking about the moral self-consciousness attempting to transform itself along some line. So we're talking about, you could call it an intentional way of living. And it might not actually be all that intentional in a completely conscious sense. One could be responding to one's culture, one's environment, talking about duty, you know, making yourself into the kind of person who will be able to fulfill one's duty and will do it as a matter of course. As a matter of fact, that's perhaps a better way to think about what Hegel's driving at here than somebody who is devoting tons and tons of thought and introspection and self-scrutiny and doing journaling and keeping track of that sort of thing. Why is that the case? Well, to, to talk about this in very broad terms, to sort of jump you know, to a high level of abstraction, what this paragraph is really about, what it's really saying is that in trying to realize morality, we destroy it. Now, why is that the case? We've talked about this already in previous paragraphs. So some of what Hegel is saying here is really recapping. So let's turn to the text now. He says, what consciousness really holds to be the truth, the Wahrheit of the matter is only this intermediate stage of imperfection. What intermediate stage are we talking about? The stage where we are doing something, we're advancing, we're making, you could say, progress. And how do we make progress in perfection? We do that precisely by acting through behavior, through comportment, through choices that we make. Handeln has been the word, and Handlung has been the other word, used over and over, although we could also use Tat, the deed, right? But Handlung has this, this notion of something iterative, something that we're doing over and over and over again. What we're doing, or at least what we're striving to do, is to move from a point, a beginning point, of a lack of perfection towards a greater perfection and ultimately the pinnacle of it. Now we saw in the previous paragraph that what moral consciousness is doing is really a game with itself. It doesn't have a clear idea of what this perfection would be. It represents it in a beyond. And it says, well, you know, I'll never actually get to that beyond, but so long as I'm, I'm doing my best, so long as I'm getting, as you know, the, the old adage, every day I'm getting better and better and better. That self-affirmation thing people were supposed to say to themselves looking in the mirror. Hegel's saying, no, that's not going to work at all. It's not going to work in the sense it's not going to lead you to where you want to go. And he's going to give us two reasons for that. So he says, Consciousness uh, focuses on this intermediate stage of imperfection, but this is at least supposed to be a progress towards perfection. 
What is a progress towards perfection? It is moving to one state where you're a bit more perfect than another state where you're a bit more perfect. Another state, hopefully you're not doing any backsliding because if you do any, as we call it, backsliding, uh, then you have to start from the beginning again or at least wherever you backslid to. You can represent this to yourself spatially however you like. Climbing a mountain, you know, you slip down 10 feet. Now you've got to cover that 10 feet again. So this is what Hegel is driving at in examining the way a lot of people think about their moral life. Hegel says it cannot even be that. Why? So here's the first reason. To advance in morality would really be to move towards its disappearance. So if you're making progress and you were actually able to make progress all the way to the end, there would be no morality. If it was to be realized, if it was to be a wirklichkeit, an actuality, it would no longer exist. Why? Well, this goes back to what moral consciousness is struggling with. Nature, its own nature, right? Moral consciousness is situated in a human being and that human being has a nature and that nature includes inclinations, Nigogen, right? And drives, Trieben, right? These things that are perhaps unconscious, perhaps less conscious, certainly you know, we could say appetite, we could say desires, whatever you like. They seem to be irrational, they have a law of their own, and they drive us in ways that lead us towards what we conceive of as happiness, but away from our duty. So we have to suppress those, or we have to bring them under reason. We have to make them rational. We have to transform them in the process. When we've done that entirely, we wind up over here and then we no longer have to struggle at all. We have at that point, what Kant in his uh, religion within the limits of reason alone calls a holy will, a will that no longer has to struggle against inclinations, appetites, desires, our frail, damaged human nature, but automatically chooses to do the right thing, wills correctly. But if it does that automatically, doing what you would think would be absolutely right, it's no longer right. There's no longer, Hegel is saying, any moral significance. So morality winds up being destroyed. It winds up vanishing in the very process of trying to realize it. So he says the goal, in this case, the goal would turn into the nothingness or the abolition of morality. And then he says something a little bit more interesting. Not only the abolition of morality, the abolition of consciousness itself. Now, why would consciousness be gone. Why wouldn't the person be over here and just be like a pure duty? It's so wonderful. I'm realizing it. Wow. I don't even have to think about it. I just sort of automatically do my duty. This is so great. Um, well, in order for there to be consciousness of duty, duty has to be opposed to something else. And this is the problematic that Hegel is working with here. So we have a, another form of self-deception happening on the part of the moral consciousness. Now here's the second reason. He says, advancing as such, like diminishing, advancing and diminishing are both quantitative differences. Whenever you see Hegel bringing up this word quantitative, Imagine that there's always a bad taste in your mouth because Hegel thinks that the quantitative is not particularly good, important, essential. It's just mere quantitative difference. And it doesn't, I mean, this is kind of a pun, right? Quantitative differences don't add up to anything. They are arbitrary. They are abstract. They don't produce anything. And it's not like you can quantify morality, even though we might come up with interesting rubrics for it. And he says, there can be no question of these, namely, namely quantitative differences in it, in genuine advancing. 
So he says, in morality, as in consciousness, for which the moral purpose is pure duty, there cannot be any thought of difference, least of all the superficial one of quantity. There is only one virtue, one tugend, right? Only one pure duty, only one morality. It's like an off-on switch. It's not like a dimmer switch. Either you're going to fulfill what virtue requires, what duty requires, what morality requires, or you're not. And if you say, well, I got halfway there. You know, well, you didn't get any of the way there. Right? If you, getting halfway doesn't mean anything more than getting one third of the way or you know, ticking off seven of the boxes of the ten. Either you do the whole thing or you don't. That's what Hegel's saying here about morality as understood by consciousness. So we have an impasse here. And now we have to see where this impasse is going to lead us. Since then, it is not moral perfection that is taken seriously, but rather the intermediate state, that is, as just argued, non-morality, we thus return from another aspect to the content of the first postulate. That is, we cannot understand how happiness is to be demanded for this moral consciousness on the ground of its worthiness. It is aware of its imperfection and cannot, therefore, in point of fact, demand happiness as a dessert, as something of which it is worthy. It can only ask for happiness to be granted as a free act of grace. That is, it can only ask for happiness as such, as something existing in and for itself, and can expect it not on the absolute ground mentioned above, but as coming to it by chance and caprice. Here, then, non-morality declares just what it is that it is concerned not about morality, but solely about happiness as such without reference to morality. Now in paragraph 624, Hegel is going to reintroduce the consideration of happiness, something that he has been talking about quite a bit throughout the entire phenomenology, particularly in the reason and the spirit section. And in relation to morality, we've talked about the postulation of a harmony between happiness and morality. And we talked about how that would actually take place. Here, there's no postulating that. We're, we're, we've already left that a bit behind. Instead, what we have is a disjunction between morality and happiness. And happiness is going to be revealed as taking the place of morality. And, and why is this important? Well, remember what this entire section is about for Stalin, which is dissemblance or duplicity, moral consciousness deceiving itself, and really, in, in effect, deceiving other people in what it's saying about its own motives and its own process. So he says, it's not moral perfection that's taken seriously. Why? Because if we realized morality, we would destroy it. And because, you know, you can't actually get there by a bunch of steps. And because it's off in this beyond, that makes it, you know, solely ideal. Uh, this perfection of morality just is not possible at this stage. He says, it's not moral perfection that's taken seriously. Instead, it's this intermediate stage, this process of progress towards something that's never realized. And, and that has been now valorized for its own sake by moral consciousness so that it can, it can in effect lie to itself and say, I'm a good guy because I'm, at least I'm trying, at least I'm making some progress. Even though I'll never reach the end, at least I'm on the right track. And now this is something worth thinking about. I'm going to diverge a little bit from the text. When you say something like that, like I'm making progress towards this ideal and because I'm actually making progress in measurable ways along that path, how do you know you're actually going in the right direction? If you could never realize that ideal, if you can't even truly cognize it, as Hegel said in you know, several paragraphs earlier, how do you know you're going in that direction? And that's something worth thinking about. I'm going to leave that aside for right now because he's not actually worried at this point. He's, he's got a different issue that he's going to bring up. So he says, because it's this intermediate state, 
And what is this intermediate state? Well, if we want to be quite clear about it, you could call it moral progress, but it's really because it's just moral progress, non-morality. It's, it's not moral. If I'm struggling with my desires and inclinations and repressing them or rationalizing them in some way, just so I can actually do the right thing that I'm not really inclined to do, I am in some sense acting morally, but in another sense, I'm not acting morally at all because to be moral would be to have the right inclinations, wouldn't it? To have the right desires. So he goes on and he says, we return from another aspect to the content of the first postulate. What was the first postulate? Had to do with happiness, the harmony, the integration between happiness and morality. I'm a good boy. I do the right thing. So I'm going to be rewarded with happiness. But now notice what Hegel says here. I can't be moral. I can't ever realize this, even though I'm making progress, even though I'm striving, even though my actions and motivations are oriented in what I think to be the right way. So... Why do I deserve happiness at all? Why does happiness enter into the picture? You could say, well, you know, if, if, if you don't get enough happiness, you can't sustain yourself along the way. But maybe this desire for happiness is what keeps me from being moral, isn't it? Maybe giving me a little bit of happiness to secure me along the path is actually leading me away from the path. Or... We don't really know. Maybe I'm only on the path to get those little bits of happiness along the way. Maybe I've got the wrong motivation. Maybe I'm learning the wrong lesson by getting this little pill of happiness at each point. So he says, we cannot understand how happiness is to be demanded for this moral consciousness on a particular ground. What would the particular ground be? It's worthiness. It doesn't have any moral value. It's not worthy of enjoying happiness. If anybody's worthy of enjoying happiness, it's the person who does his duty because he recognizes it as his duty and doesn't seek his own happiness. Then, then the happiness is like a reward that you get afterwards, but you could actually say, well, that's the wrong person to give it to because what the hell does he care? He's already done his duty. Adding happiness to it isn't going to make him any better. Here's, here's a place, by the way, where various deontological theories really <clears throat> do in fact differ from each other, where the Kantian way is radically different from, say, the natural law of Thomas Aquinas way or the Stoic way where duty is to be done, but it's going to lead to happiness for us, right? For Kant, if happiness enters in as a motive at all, you've already screwed it up. It's not moral. So I can't deserve happiness if I'm this person here or even the person who's making constant moral progress. I don't deserve happiness. Can I have happiness? Is it possible for me to enjoy it? Well, sure. Of course it is. Because, you know, happiness is the satisfaction of your, your inclinations and desires or however else you want to figure it. So he says, this consciousness is aware of its imperfection, so it can't demand happiness as a dessert, something of which it is worthy. But it can, notice the word that he uses here, it can ask for happiness as such, as something existing in and for itself. Happiness does exist. People do enjoy happiness. We, we enjoy uh, whatever uh, portion of happiness we do have. It is happiness, right? Glucleikite. We, we do enjoy that. We are gluclic every once in a while. But... It's not something we deserve. So how do we get it? When does anybody give it to us? He says, it can only ask for happiness to be granted as a free act of grace. That is, it can only ask for happiness as such 
as something existing in and for itself, not something that is intrinsic to our nature, not something that we deserve, not something that's actually integrated to our life. If we do enjoy happiness on this process of progress, it just sort of happens to us. I mean, it's happiness that happens, right? Uh, the the Anglo-Saxon uh, root to this captures this a bit better than Hegel's German does. Uh, hap, happenstance, happiness, right? And it means fortune. We're, we're fortunate. We are blessed is another way of thinking about it. And we're not blessed through our own work or our own disposition. We're just lucky bastards who happen to have been fortunate enough to enjoy that happiness that whatever intelligence or even non-intelligence out there is doling out had, it, had us in, in, in the lucky crosshairs, just like somebody who's in the crowd when they're shooting the t-shirt cannon at the concert, right? Well, if you're in the right place at the right time, you get the happiness. Or not. If you're not in the right place at the right time, the universe says, screw you. You don't get any happiness. Or you get the wrong kind. <laughs> you know, this is a bit of a digression. Aristotle, in talking about friendship, he uh, talks about, you know, we should give our friends what it is that they actually want and what's good for them. Because when you give somebody something they don't want, he says, that's almost worse than not giving them something at all. W meaning, give them something they don't want in place of what it is that they actually want. So if what they really want is for you to, you know, tell them what a, a cool guy they are, then giving them candy or, you know, inviting them to a party or, you know, giving them a great book, they don't care. What they want is you to, to kiss up to them and say, oh, you're so cool. You know, what, what great sunglasses or, you know, whatever it is that you think is cool about them. You can say the same thing about happiness. If I give you what counts as happiness for me, you might not be happy at all. So we have to be fortunate in the universe lining up with us and smacking into the thing that's actually going to make us happy. I mean, I'll give you an example for myself. I like looking out of our window at, you know, uh, in the early morning when, when the sun is starting to rise and, and uh, also uh, at night, we have a beautiful view out of the one window we have in our apartment. Um, you might look at that and be like, meh, doesn't do anything for me. I'd rather have a pie <laughs> or I'd rather be watching a show or I'd rather be rock climbing. And, you know, I don't want to rock climb. I, I like pie, I like shows, but I don't want to rock climb. Happiness is something that we wind up blundering into. So he says that we have a free act of grace and he says, um, we can expect it not on the absolute ground mentioned above. What is the absolute ground? Deserving happiness. But as coming to it by chance and caprice. Wilker. Arbitrary. Right? If somebody wants to give it to us, then we get it. So he finishes up here by saying, non-morality declares just what it is. That it is concerned not about morality. It's not actually making progress towards morality. It's actually concerned about happiness without reference to morality. So we don't have a unification, let alone a harmonization or integration of morality and happiness. Instead, we have a detouring where moral consciousness in its progress is really aiming after its own happiness. And it is not moral, but it is actual. 